Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast, How to Become a Better Safety Leader, sponsored by Alert Media. With that, let's introduce our speakers. With us today are Eric McNulty and Peter Steinfeld. Eric is the Associate Director and Program Faculty at the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative at Harvard University and is an instructor at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's a widely published business author, speaker, and researcher. Eric is also the principal author of case studies on leadership decision-making in the Boston Marathon bombing response, innovation in the response to Superstorm Sandy, and the professional and political interface in the Deepwater Horizon response. He teaches in multiple executive education programs at Harvard and MIT, as well as graduate level courses on leadership, negotiation, and conflict resolution at Harvard. Peter is the Senior Vice President of Safety Solutions at Alert Media and host of the Employee Safety Podcast, where each week he interviews safety, security, business continuity, and disaster recovery experts from all over the world. Peter has been involved in the emergency communications industry for nearly 20 years, advising organizations of all sizes on matters related to employee safety. And he's passionate about helping organizations protect their most valuable asset, their people. Now I'd like to welcome in Katie Gowen, Director of Content and Communications at Alert Media to take us through today's event. Go ahead, Katie. Thank you so much, Alan, and hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be your moderator today. And we're here to talk about safety leadership, which can be difficult these days, as all of you probably know better than anyone. But I think today's conversation is really going to give you some guidance and some tips on how to be an effective, supportive, and proactive leader, both in your day-to-day -day roles and in crisis situations. So I'm not going to spend too much time here next on our guests, since Alan did such a lovely job introducing them. But Eric and Peter, it's so great to have you both here today. Eric, thank you for taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you, Peter. Great to see you. Likewise. Peter, it's, it's <laughs> always great to see you here as well. So thank you for your time. Looking forward to today's discussion. Absolutely. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I am going to go ahead and go over today's agenda just so we all know what to expect. First, we're going to talk about the role of the EHS leader, why there are so many changes taking place lately, and um, you know how difficult, like I alluded to earlier, it is to be an EHS leader today. We're also going to talk about the meta leadership framework, which Eric is going to go into all the details of in just a few minutes. We'll talk about some common leadership mistakes and how to avoid them. And then finally, we're going to get to our Ask the Experts section. So for those of you who submitted questions upon registration, thank you so much for doing that. It really helps us kind of um, fill out our content for the day and kind of know where everyone is in terms of what they're looking for. And if you didn't submit a question, no worries. As Alan said, you can do that with the Q&A box anytime. So those registration questions were incorporated into the slides that you'll see here today. We, we got to as many as we could. But again, go ahead and, um, you know, submit those questions and we can get to those later on as well. So we will cover your questions as best we can. Now, I want to get started with a poll. Um, kind of just want to get a feel for where everyone is right now. So if you could go ahead and answer the question that you see now on your screen. How confident are you currently in your ability to lead your workforce through organizational changes or crises? So would you say that currently you're extremely confident, confident, neutral, not confident, or perhaps you're not currently a safety leader? So let me give that just a few more seconds. If you could go ahead and get your responses in now, that would be great. And now let's go ahead and close that out and share the results if we could, please. Okay, so it looks like 49% of our audience is saying they feel confident. But what's interesting is all of the options are represented here. So clearly there's gonna be a little bit of something for everyone today. So Eric, what, what are your thoughts there? Is this about what you expected to see? Well, I'm, I'm really happy to see this level of confidence and I'm glad that uh, I think it's always room to get better here. Uh, but you can also see a significant number of folks are worried about how, to, how do they get better? They're neutral or not confident. Uh, but I'm glad to see this audience is paying attention and investing in their own leadership development. Absolutely. Peter, do you have anything to add to that? No, that was very well said. Same thoughts. 
Excellent. Well, we will go ahead and close that out and move on to the role of the EHS leader. So I'm going to turn it over to Peter now. He's going to talk about how these roles are evolving and why so many changes are taking place. So Peter, take it away. Absolutely. Thank you, Katie. And I'm just going to tee things up. The real star of the show is Eric. So between what he presents and the questions that he's going to tackle, it's going to be great. But I think this will help. And let's start by talking about how the roles of EH leaders have changed over the recent years. Um, I've actually heard from many of our customers here at Alert Media, along with our partners, and even a lot of the podcast guests that I interview who are in EHS leadership roles, that they've experienced really a huge shift in their purviews in the last few years. They're still certainly responsible for duties like complying with agency regulations, overseeing site and equipment in inspections, and conducting things like safety meetings or trainings, but their scope has really expanded, and I'm sure many of you here today have experienced that too. Um, these days, it's not just about keeping your on-site employees physically safe from harm, like it has been historically. Now it's also more about keeping a hybrid workforce both physically and psychologically safe from harm. Uh, according to the NSC, more than 85% of Americans say that work impacts their mental health. And the NSC encourages employers to prioritize protecting employee mental health and safety on an equal level to that of physical safety. Now, that's a lot for you to be accountable for as an EHS professional, and it really requires additional tools and skill sets. And you're already wearing so many hats, and now you're expected to be experts in these new areas. Yet, you must simultaneously maintain the same or perhaps even give more focus to uh, the laws and regulations that protect your people while they're on the job. Now, unfortunately, even though you're taking on more responsibility, it doesn't mean you have more to work with, more resources, more dollars, and things like that. Uh, many of you are relying on the same or perhaps even less resources, budget, and technology. Uh, in fact, a recent safety and salary survey found that safety leaders are indeed increasingly being asked to do a lot more with less. So that really begs the question, why is that? Well, there's a few reasons. First, the global threat landscape continues to intensify and the number of disasters and crises that involve people are increasing both in impact and frequency. Uh, and there's also a stronger likelihood of concurrent emergencies or disasters these days. Uh, second, the pandemic obviously shined a really bright spotlight on the importance of mental health and well-being in the workplace, <laughs> resulting in a really heightened focus on the psychological safety of workers. And then lastly, many organizations are experiencing labor or economic issues like attracting and retaining talent, rising costs due to inflation, and even layoffs. So this means that many safety teams are just lean or understaffed. And going back to that survey I mentioned earlier, they asked, I think it was a little over 1,100 safety professionals, what the biggest workplace challenge was that they faced last year. And by far, the most common answer was a need for more staff, more employees, more resources, more support. So moving forward, it's really crucial that you learn to adapt to these organizational changes and broader scopes of responsibility that you have. Now, when it comes to doing more with less, you simply can't lead the same way that you always have before. Changes in responsibility mean changes in your approach to leadership. And look, we know it's not easy. In fact, it's incredibly difficult. We hear it all the time, and we certainly empathize with what you're struggling with. Uh, but there's no secret sauce for being a great EHS leader in this new environment, which was why we've partnered with Eric and NPLI to shed some additional light on this topic for you. So NPLI has been at the forefront of leadership practice and research for over 20 years now. Uh, they prepare individuals to lead more effectively. And this is important with a lot greater confidence during crisis and during change. So I said it before, but you're definitely in great hands today. Eric, I believe you have a really tried and true framework that can help our audience adapt and even thrive in their roles. So I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you very much. And you're right. The role is changing a lot. And we see this in the people we work with, those who come through our executive education programs. Um, they are being asked to do more. And as you say, we're thinking more about safety and the whole EHS role much more expansively than what's happened in the past. And the meta leadership framework, which has been developed over the past 20 years, um, really is meant to help address that and it always has been meant to get people to take a more expansive uh, view of their role. That's why that meta prefix is there, much like meta research or meta analysis. It's meant to <clears throat> remind you to take your, your head up out of your specialty and, and look more broadly. Uh, it's useful in crisis as well as every day. 
We have trained more than 10,000 people around the world. I've trained many crisis teams myself around the world. And it really, we draw on a broad range of, of areas of expertise in order to put this together. So from neuroscience to psychology, understanding organizational behavior, all the different levers you have to understand how do you be an effective leader and how can you get the organization overall to, to be a more leaderful organization. And at the heart of that, and if we can go to the next slide, Katie, uh, is the meta leadership framework, which is intentionally simple. We didn't want to make something that was hard to understand. And this is, we don't come from a theoretical base. We Our work is, is very much field-based, very practical. And you heard earlier in my bio about some of the case studies I've done. We get out into the field to be with leaders in difficult situations or uh, to talk to safety teams and really get to know what, what are their challenges, what's working, what's not. And that's where we develop our approach. Now, the three dimensions you see here in, in the symbol on the right side of the, of the uh, slide, in the center is the person, you. You have to know yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, what you bring to the table, because there is no generic great EHS leader. You're each gonna inhabit that role a bit differently. So introverts versus extroverts, somebody who's been on the job five years versus 25 years, even things like your birth order will affect your personality. And so you, you wanna embrace that role in a way that's authentic to you. Uh, yes, there are some common skills. We'll talk about those. But in terms of how you step into the role, it's going to be you as an individual. Now, you, of course, are in a situation that's that big red circle. You have to understand the context in which you're operating. So what are the threats? What's the state of the business? What's the overall uh, situation in terms of the, the social situation, the, the communities in which you operate, the economy? All that plays into the, the safety environment. And then at the end of the day, it's all about relationships, which is why you see the arrows there. You want to lead down. You want to be a great leader for your team. That's really important. That's about where 90% of the leadership uh, literature and training is. But you've also got to lead up. That's a really challenging thing in the EHS role because you've got to get the business line executives, your, your senior team to pay attention to the issues that you need to worry about to make sure that the organization is not an unnecessary risk. You've got to lead across to your peers, make sure they get them to be your allies in the efforts as well as you can be allies to them as well. And then leading beyond the chance to lead out to the community, to families, to the media, to regulators, you have the chance to, to exert influence there as well. So as you're thinking about your own leadership ability and how you're developing it, these are a good way, good lenses to put against it. How well do I understand myself and how am I going about that? Journaling and reflective practice is a great way to grow as an individual. How well do I understand the situation and what question should I be asking? And then if you assess your relationships up, down, across, and beyond the organization, you'll really see um, you know, where the leverage points are, where you can take action, where you may need to do some work to shore things up. But it's a really great guide to building your leadership over time. So rather than give you the 10 best practices, we thought we would jump in and give you some common mistakes. We're going to kind of reverse engineer the great things to do uh, by telling you some of the mistakes we've seen as we're out in the field and, and ways to avoid them. So I think this will be helpful and this also addresses some of the questions you raised. Now, one of the one, one mistakes is, is to see a, a EHS as just a specialty. Yes, there are specialized skills and knowledge you have in it, but it's also a general skill as well, a general function. Because every individual, every function in the organization can contribute to safety. Every individual and function in the organization can benefit from safety. So the extent that you see yourself as a bridge builder, as the connective tissue, you can walk anywhere out there and have something good and smart and beneficial to say. Get people to collaborate. Think about who are your natural allies. You know, and Peter mentioned that broader role now that includes things like hybrid work and uh, even you know cyber safety. You may not be doing the cyber safety that may be in IT, but you should be natural allies there. HR and legal, the folks who have a lot of paperwork to do when there's a big sa a safety incident, you know, always look for the intersection of pain and money. So they should be your allies. The maintenance and janitorial staff, make sure you thank them because when they're doing their job well, you have fewer slips and falls. So they, they should be your natural allies. So all across the organization. And then when you, as you get out and, and really get to know the business, get to know the organization, you'll be able to identify the gaps and see ways to close them. And part of how you do more with less is by, by getting more people on your side and invested in this. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. So the second big mistake we see is that safety is kind of bolted on, not baked in. What you really want to try and get to is where it's really part of the culture, where it's actually part of the cultural DNA. 
Uh, and again, I've been in organizations where you can really see that safe, they think about safety almost unconsciously because it's so baked into every single thing they do. They've made it into a routine. So, you know, we have, again, one organization I spent a lot of time with, every meeting where there was somebody either from outside the organization or outside that facility started with a brief safety, a short safety briefing, right? You're going to tell everybody where the bathroom is. You're going to tell them where to get a cup of coffee. Why not tell them how they can save their lives if something happens? Where's the exit? Where's the muster point? It doesn't take a long time. It's really easy, but it became very routine. And it gave you an immediate signal. We care about safety. Um, so you can do things like that. And as you're communicating the policies and procedures, don't just make it about what you care about and your sort of top list of top risks or top compliance issues. Make sure you're doing this because the organization cares about people, right? You care about the people there. You want them to get home safe to their families. You want them to be productive and engaged at work. You want to care about the things they care about. And when you can communicate that, now it becomes less about compliance and more about we're building a vibrant, healthy culture here. And so I think, you know, think about this again, beyond just the checklist to how do we make it so everybody who walks in the door understands we really care about safety. It's, it's part of who we are. It helps you attract better employees because you get people who care about safety and don't want to be in an unsafe environment. It helps you retain folks. So there's many, many benefits to doing this. And it just reflects that you're a, you know, it can be an employer of choice. You're a good community citizen when you care about your, your effect on people and their lives. The next area is where, again, people come up with a generic checklist or they've, they've looked at a generic set of risks. You really want to, to the extent that you can, inform your priorities based on data. So you can look and see where are the risks and how can we best address them. So one of the companies I've worked with uh, uh, most frequently when they looked at their global workforce, they saw the number one risk they faced were automobile accidents. They had a lot of people on the road in a lot of places. And so they got very, very serious about it. They looked and saw what were the accident and fatality rates in every region in which they were operating. They broke it down to the country level. They measured that. They People are, are judged on reducing it. And they put in place practices so they could measure their impact. So, I mean, again, some things that almost to the surface seem silly, but were important. They realized that uh, they found research that showed that backing into a parking place is, is safer than pulling in and then backing out when you're leaving. So when you go to one of their facilities, you'll see every car is back into the back into a parking place. And it isn't just at work. I've been to some employees' homes. They back into their driveways. They take it very, very seriously. Uh, they also made it a you know seatbelt where uh, used mandatory not only in company vehicles, but in every vehicle you were ever in, and it's a firing offense the first time you're caught not wearing one. And nothing like firing a vice president gets everyone's attention to see we're serious about this. And so they actually brought down, they can show how they brought down the accident rate, the fatality rate, they celebrate the successes, they can show a financial return, and it's really you know get backed by data. Once they thought they had that on the curve they wanted and on bringing things down, they looked at the number two risk, which was heart disease. So they said, okay, how do we do that? We're looking at exercise. We're looking at diet. And they aren't just looking, again, at workplace. They're looking at the whole person and their whole experience. Because, yes, if an accident happens at work, that, that's important for your reporting, your workplace error reporting, those kind of things. But wherever the accident happens, that affects whether the person's available to work, the cost of, of lost productivity, all those things, having to re, uh, replace or retrain people. So you want to help make people safe in their entire lives. And so again, they worked out and have begun to work to build it into a full a full range of programs to, to address that risk they saw. They even came up with a program for kids uh, of their employees to help them learn how to, how to be safer and better drivers, better eating, better online. And it was so popular, a couple of their customers asked if their workers' kids could come to the program. That's how you show that you are both doing it through data and baking it into your DNA. So let's talk about some of the, the leadership mistakes that happen. And again, if, depending on how long you've been in a leadership role or how new you are to the organization, you, you have to learn to, to get comfortable and, and embrace the role. And you are going to make missteps. That happens to everyone. No one is perfect. It, it, it's, uh, I've seen very experienced people make some pretty big mistakes. So you always want to be thinking about where, where is that, that leadership hazard and how do I avoid it? The first of these is what we call leading from the emotional basement. Now, we know we all have an instinctual response to threat. 
freeze flight fight, the triple F response, your amygdala fires up and it takes you into a panic response because your brain's primary job is keeping you alive. It senses a threat. It wants to move you out of the way. And if you step off a curb and there's a, a car rushing toward you and you jump right back without thinking about it, that's that triple F response kicking in. And that's a really good thing. However, when you're not in that immediate threat, the same reaction happens. And if you begin to try and lead in that panicked triple F state from that emotional basement, you can do some pretty stupid things. You know, don't hit reply all on the email when you're angry. Uh, don't get in front of the media. You really want to focus on calming down, regulating your emotions. The best way to do that is breathe. Three deep breaths. <clears throat> when you begin to control your breathing, you control everything else. You'll feel your heart rate goes down. You feel much more in control. As soon as you can show your body that you are, you're doing something you know how to do, it turns off that panic response and puts you into productive thought. So if you're called to, to either address your executives or the board or go in front of the media or community group, take those three deep breaths. You want to be measured. You want to be calm. You want to be collected because you're a role model. And people watching you, they'll begin to mimic your state. They'll begin to mimic your behavior. So if you're panicked, they're going to be panicked. If you can be calm, they'll be calm. It's one of the ways you can set the tone in the entire room. This is a tricky one. Uh, and again, I find it so important that this notion of when, when leaders focus on control, they get into trouble because you don't control everything. Uh, you don't control the media. You don't control your customers. You don't control the public. Now, what you do control, you want to do really well. Right, You want to handle the job you've got and the things you can control, you want to do a good job handling them. But beyond that, think for a moment. How, how much do you like being in control? Most people don't like it very much. However, everyone likes order. Knowing what's expected of you, I know what's expected of you, you know what to expect of me, we can work well together. When those expectations are aligned, you get a lot of harmony. That's when you get order in the situation. So as you're thinking about when you're facing a situation, how do I inject order into this? Part of it's control and controlling the things you, you have control over doing them well. But beyond that is being able to create some certainty and some clarity around key areas like mission and values and core operating principles. Those can help you bring order to the situation. Now, remember, we always put people first. Remember, we, you know, we, we always want to take this action before that action. Those kind of things inject order into the situation without you having to be the person in charge of everything, because you'll never be the person in charge of everything. And another thing is, you're, as you're leading, and this is different from managing a crisis or being that initial responder, you've got to be thinking forward. You want to be anticipating what's happened, happening next. And so often I can see people get stuck in what I call the thin edge of now. It's like, again, that, that triple F response pulls you in. In a, in a crisis situation, we know we as humans actually lose some peripheral vision, that your eyes actually focus in more tightly. And you want to step back and take that bigger view because you've got to be thinking about what, what's going to happen six hours from now, 12, 24, you know, next week, as this situation unfolds, as you go from response into recovery, you want to be thinking about that. And that's where your, your brain needs to go. Um, so make sure someone is taken care of right now. And if you've got to, you know, hopefully you aren't the only one doing everything. But if you are, even then, make sure you pull some time back and say, next hour, now that things seem to be in, under relative control, I got to think about what's coming next. Uh, where you've got a larger team, you can dedicate people to doing some, some scenario planning. What's our best case, worst case, most likely case? Begin to game that out and ask, what has to be true for that to happen? What decisions do we have to make? What resources do we have to allocate? So again, you're thinking, you're trying to get one step ahead of what's happening so that you're able to, to exert more influence on the situation. If you're always in that reactive mode, one step back, it's really, really hard to catch up. And then you're at the mercy of the situation instead of the other way around. Now we have a tool for this called the pop talk loop, which I'll very briefly explain. And you can go to YouTube and look it up. We have a, a short video, which will tell you in more detail. But it's a way of getting your leadership rhythm and getting you thinking forward. So that pop is the analysis side. Think of a figure eight loop. And on the left-hand side, you've got three steps, pop, perceive, begin to bring in information, gather data as to what's happening. O is for orient, look for patterns in that data. What's happening? What's the meaning here? Our brains are natural pattern-seeking machines. So begin to see, what, what do I think is happening here? The second P is for predict. Once you see a pattern, patterns tend to repeat themselves. 
So once you see what's happening, you can predict what's going to happen next. You begin to do that move into the forward thinking. That's the analysis side. When you move to the right hand of the figure eight, the dock side, now you've got to decide. You've actually got to make some decisions based on those predictions. What do you need to have happen? You make some decisions, you've got to operationalize it because if you don't turn the decision into action, nothing is going to happen. So make a decision. What resources do I need? How much time is it going to take? Do we have to get authorization from anyone? We have to bring in other stakeholders, et cetera. And then the final, the C, the final step is communicate. Make sure everybody knows what's going on, what the plan is, how you're carrying it out. Once you've gone through that loop once, you go back and do it again because hopefully you'll have changed the situation. Those decisions you've made, the actions you've taken will have changed things on the ground. You want to re-perceive and say, are things going the way we thought they were going to go? If so, you know, do more, go to your next step. If not, you pause and figure out what's not right, what's not working here, and make appropriate adjustments. So going through that structured process, it's six different cognitive processes, it's how our brains naturally work when they're working really well, can give you rhythm. And you can go through that yourself in a matter of seconds in a familiar situation, or you can use that as a structure for a longer meeting with your full team to get everybody on the same page, make sure they're acting in concert, and you're going toward that. Uh, that desired outcome. So often I see that, that people forget to engage all their stakeholders. They get the obvious ones, uh, but you miss some of the, the stakeholders you miss are the ones who are going to come back and be the pain in your rear end afterwards because they don't feel like they were treated appropriately. You didn't know what their concerns were. So again, to do some stakeholder mapping, uh, as to who's going to care about what in any given situation. You can pre-map a lot of this, actually. If you think about, okay, we've got uh, a flood, a fire, or whatever it happens to be, begin to think through who are the logical stakeholders here? What are they going to care about? Who's going to be on our side supporting us? Who may be out all of a sudden calling us the bad you know, the bad people? Um, and who's a swayable? And often that swayable group is, is the biggest one because most people aren't paying attention to you day in and day out. But all of a sudden, if you wind up in the media, they hear some other reports about what's going on. They're trying to figure out, are, are you the, the victim, the hero, the villain? And if you can sway them toward the more positive end of that continuum, the better. And also be thinking about the secondary situation and who's going to be affected. I remember one of the more startling things I learned when I, I deployed during Superstorm Sandy down to New York and New Jersey. And uh, there was a, a, a cemetery right next to one of the major oil storage facilities. And there was a bunch of oil like that came out, like the big, those giant tanks actually got moved off their footings. Oil spilled into the graveyard. And I was talking to the incident commander there who was working on it. And he said, I have 185 separate oil spill sites because every one of those graves was a person. That person had a family and that's what they cared about. And so now you had this sort of multiplicity of stakeholders to worry about and you had to do it with dignity. You had to do it with speed. Be very careful. And so be thinking about not just the big incident, but those secondary and tertiary incidents that can really complicate things down the road. So again, that meta that, that meta thinking of taking the bigger picture and trying to step back and really get a good, good sense of the whole situation you're facing will help you make the right leadership decisions. We had a couple of questions about burnout that were submitted in advance. And this is where, again, as a leader, you've really got to be thinking about pacing. Um, how fast do we need to go in for how long? Because your real job is to keep yourself and others stronger longer. And again, when an incident hits, everyone wants to go fast and often that's very appropriate. You've got to take immediate action. But as the situation begins to unfold, if it's more than a, a very short-term incident, not everything has to go super fast. You've got to differentiate what has to go fast, who's worrying about that, what can take a, a little bit longer time, what's the appropriate time to make decisions or get things done um, realize that, you know, everybody can't run a sprint. And if you burn people out, if you wear them out, uh, you're not going to have a good team there to, to, to finish the incident. So uh, be thinking about how do you give people breaks? And that can be, you know, and yourself, you've got to give yourself a break as well. Make sure you're getting off, getting some rest. Uh, if you're working 20 hour shifts, you know, you're not going to last that long. We all have physical and psychological uh, limits and you won't be, you won't be making good decisions You'll get you know short tempered. It just it, it degrades the entire situation. So one of the things I think is most important I, that the best organizations do, but a lot of organizations don't, is think about how you're going to onboard and offboard on your crisis team. So you have to have those backup players so that if somebody's working, you know, let them work eight hours, have a good handoff 
process. So you can hand it off to the next folks who are going to work eight hours, hand it back, and so on. Everybody gets their rest. Everybody gets to be at their best, which is really what you want um, to be able to do that. But if you can't do that full rest period, even research has shown, even getting outside for a, for a five or 10 minute walk, getting out in the trees and fresh air, that really will rejuvenate you. Short naps can help. But if you don't take care of yourself, you won't be able to take care of others and you will not be in a position to lead effectively. Eric. Thank you so much for all of that information. You explain it so articulately. There is a term we use in podcast production. You speak in sound bites. So you could just grab any sentence that you say, and it's going to be a, a compelling quote. So thank well, you for that. Thank you, James. Well, now, a lot of short times. I'm looking forward to the questions. Yes, absolutely. So we're going to get to the questions portion now, as you can see. Um, Again, we incorporated as many as we could early on, but go ahead and ask some now too, and we'll get to what we can. So Peter, I know you're gonna moderate these, so why don't you go ahead and take it away? What do we got? Absolutely, yeah, we received tons of great questions. So thank you for that, much appreciated. And I think this should make for a really good discussion. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know that we'll be able to get to them all, but I think we'll capture the spirit of most everything that was asked. And if not, please feel free to reach out afterward as well. We're happy to follow up. Um, there are four or five general categories of questions that we received. They start with general leadership and management questions. Then those that are around things like early career and buy-in that somewhat blend together. Some regarding safety culture in general, and then a few around communication specifically. Um, so that's kind of the category you'll see as we go through this. But uh, let's go ahead and jump in. The first one is, I think, uh, came in several times. Um, how do I manage up to my leadership? to my direct manager, to my executives in general, that's always a big challenge. A lot of people don't know how to manage up. So what are your thoughts on that? It really is one of the most important things you have to worry about and one of the most challenging. You really want to try and build a, a productive relationship with your boss and perhaps your boss's boss, depending on, again, in an EHS role, sometimes you're called in to brief or, or work with people who are, could be several levels above you because of your expertise and, and the situation at hand. Um, we're thinking about this, do you have to think about what do they care about from their perspective? What are the challenges they're facing? Who do they report to? So you can be giving them the information or asking the questions of them. They're going to help them be smarter with the people they have to talk to and addressing their particular challenges. And that could be investors. It could be a board. It could be the media that if you're a CEO has to get out in front of the media. And in preparedness, one of the things I have found most effective is to try and have that conversation around who wants to make which decisions in certain situations? So if you had to, for example, evacuate one of your facilities, who makes that call? And what information do they want to have in order to be able to make that call? When you go through the various decisions that have to get made, if you could, first of all, executives tend to like to talk about decisions because they think they're good at them. You want them to be good at them. So if you can know, you know, for example, I've worked with firms that have had employees kidnapped, for example, depending on parts of the world where they work. If we're going to decide if we're going to negotiate or not, who's making that decision? You don't want to be battling that out in the moment. You want to think through that one in advance. And again, think of what information do you want? What outside resources may you need to make that kind of decision? That gets you into a really productive conversation. Up, it shows how you can be useful. And when the situation, when you get to an incident, it's really helpful because you already have a head start on what that person is going to want and what they care about. So you can make that first brief a good one. And if the first brief is good, everything tends to calm down you'll get a bit more space to operate. And then you're more in control of the situation rather than having to react to the person who shows up, thinks they're in charge, but has really no idea what they're doing. And so that's why that first brief is so critical. Yeah, that's great. And I love that idea of looking at the world through their eyes and what they care about, because if you can then address that, then they'll start to listen and want to engage with you. If you're just talking about a bunch of stuff that you care about, but they don't, then it's like, ah, I don't have time for this. Yeah, watch the details because often, again, people you can come in with a, a ton of details. If they aren't relevant to what that what that person above you is thinking about, they don't care, and you're just not, not they're now thinking you're less relevant than you need to be. So, be very careful. Don't overwhelm folks with, with a million details. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, oh, real quick, I forgot to do this before we start with the questions, but um, uh, some people asked me to clarify some acronyms I used. I apologize; I shouldn't have done that. Um, one acronym I used was EHS environmental health and safety. 
uh, and the other was NPLI. That's the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative at Harvard University. So just clarifying that for the, for you, for, for y'all out there. Um, sorry about that. Uh, but continue on in the questions, this next one I thought was really poignant. Um, and that is, how do I avoid and manage my own threat assessment bias and assumptions? I can imagine that if you do this day in and day out, you start kind of thinking the same way all the time. How do you step back from that to make sure you address each situation freshly? That's a really good point because we all come to every situation with biases. That's how our, our brain cuts through all the data we have to process every day, the great little shortcuts that turn into biases. Um, so one way is to ask, so what has to be true for this assessment to be correct, which will get you thinking more deeply about your assumptions and what you, you may have taken for granted. So what underlying situation, situations have to be true for this to be folding out, the unfolding this way? Another thing is also just to, to ask the people around you. And I, one of the things I've done when I've been out doing workshops with people, uh, we're going to we build scenarios on the fly to work through PopDoc and some other tools. And I just say, what's keeping you awake at night? And some of the things they say will be things I'm aware of that were in the corporate risk register. And there'll be other things that nobody ever thought of. Um, you know, I'm, I'm worried about my employees. Uh, I remember one of them, early, this was several years ago, but talked about radicalized employees before we had our, our whole raft of that. And everyone was all of a sudden, ooh, how did we not think of that? And that was just by asking somebody in the field who had a very diverse workforce and um, and has, you know, they had had some, some social unrest who said, this is what keeps me awake at night. Is what happens if this happens? And we're, we're all of a sudden the bad guys, not the good guys. Um, so just asking that question will give you fresh perspectives on this. So those are two, two ways I think you can help overcome those biases. Yeah, I like the idea of uh, talking to your peers in other industries yeah. that have a similar role and say, hey, what are you guys faced with? Um, and then they'll start to say things. You're like, what? <laughs> we, we don't face that, but oh my gosh, maybe we could. And it just starts you thinking and down a different path. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Next one on the list. Um, this one's pretty common. A lot of people uh, struggle with this one, but uh, I'm an introvert and struggle with interpersonal skills. How can I lead folks if I don't really have the best charisma? Or perhaps as another person asked it, how do I overcome imposter syndrome? So I would say the first thing is to, you're not an introvert. You have, you have introversion qualities. Right. This isn't a stamp you can you can never overcome or or compensate for. And there are times as an introvert, you may have to step up and, and be forward and outside and engaging. It's going to be hard. It's going to be tiring. But realize you can do that. So my, my own uh, Myers-Briggs, I'm right on the introvert, extrovert, uh, right on that dividing line. I have to get up and speak in front of people for a living. And so I have to go out and be an extrovert for a bit. But then I plan a time to relax. I don't do a presentation and then go right to a big dinner with a lot of people. I give myself time to, to relax. Also realizing and just to embrace that one of the most effective leaders I ever worked with was very quiet, actually very uh, diminutive person. So not a tall commanding presence, but everyone paid attention to her. What she said was important. She was careful in what she said. She didn't try and fake that she wasn't an introvert or a quiet person. And people actually would lean in to listen. So just embrace that's who you are. And try and structure situations that are comfortable for you. You will have time to have to get out in front of people, uh, but also realize that it is not a limitation on your on your ability to lead. It just means you have to think think appropriately about how you're going to exercise those skills. I also recommend the work of a woman named Susan Cain, C A I N. She's written a great book and has a couple of videos online about how to lead as an introvert. Well, following up on that, another question that came in several times was, how do I motivate and lead others when I have no substantial authority? That's the eternal challenge of people in this field, because you've got authority in certain areas, usually around compliance, which means you're bringing the stick into the room, but you really want to motivate people and get them excited and interested in what you're trying to do. Uh, again, here, much like leading up, Think about what they care about. What, what are the challenges they're facing? What are their hopes? What are, they, what are their pressures? What are they trying to do? And how can you tie what you're doing to what they're doing? Um, and that will be a way to, to, to them. So you're not talking at them, but you're doing something with them. Uh, so if they're trying to grow the business, think about how safety can help that. Can help, again, attract, can help attract new employees, can help you retain people, can it help you minimize the days lost to accidents and injuries, which makes it easier to grow the business. Try and make that linkage. 
no one ever has all the authority they want. Uh, but also think about your, your power in any situation. Part of it is positional power. Again, you're, if you're, whatever your particular title is comes with a certain uh, list of things you can, you can do and or authorities you can exercise. But another kind of power is called referent power. And that is your, your power as an individual. If you're someone that people see when you show up, you, know, you show up on time, you're well prepared for a meeting, you're going to have good ideas, you're invested in that larger mission or solving that larger problem, not in taking credit for yourself, they're going to want you in the room. That's a basic premise of, of, of influence. So if you're that person who's a good team member and you're going to contribute positive things when you're, when you're in a meeting or you're in a conversation with someone, you're going to have amazing influence, completely irrespective of your authority. Uh, your expertise will also give you some influence, but just being that that person who, again, who helps solve problems, who's a positive contributor, that will give you tremendous influence. Yeah, and I always think about the fact that people don't do what you want because you want them to do it. They do things because they want to do it. Exactly. <laughs> so you have to give them a reason to want to do it. <laughs> and that, that's really key. That's hard. It is super hard to do that. But if you always think that way, like, look at that person, what are the lenses they look uh, through and what would make them want to do this? That's what I've got to talk to, not just like a re a law or a policy or something like that. So that that's huge. Um, Chad, I did see your question come in. I'm definitely going to get to it when I get to my uh, communication section that I talked about. So don't worry, hold on. I just want to follow this train of thought here. Um, can you explain how emotions factor into decision making? That's a big part of it. We're emotional creatures, not necessarily logical. Exactly. Peter, you hit it on the head. We are, we as humans are much less rational than we think we are. And we are, we are actually all mammals are very emotionally driven. It's an important part of how we make sense of the world. So the, the greatest number of neuroreceptors in your body are up here in your brain. The second greatest number are down in your gut. And they're connected by a big nerve called the vagus nerve that runs up and down your spinal column. So your rational side and your emotional side are in constant conversation, making sense of the world and helping you make appropriate decisions. So first of all, don't think emotions are, you, you can put them away or you can't, you know, you take them off the table. You can't, we can't function that way. What you can do though, is think about how do you regulate those emotions? How do you process those emotions and how do you display those emotions? So, and you want to be you know, appropriate in, in certain situations, obviously, and keep things under control. So one of the people I've worked with a lot, um, the healthcare system out on the, out on the West Coast, and uh, the retired naval officer uh, who has a, bi a bit of a temper. And um, he trained his XO, his executive officer, to um, tell him <clears throat> when he could see that the commanding officer, so he's, he's about to yell at people, say, sir, time to talk to the seagulls. And he would go outside and he would go <laughs> yell at the seagulls for a few minutes, get it out of the system, and then come back in and have a, a, a more reasoned conversation. Um, so you want to be thinking about when are emotions your friend and again, showing vulnerability, showing empathy, or that you're, if you've lost a colleague to an, to a fatality, or if it's somebody been seriously injured, express that, right? But we, you don't want it to get in your way that of you being able to get things moving and, and take care of it. So you want to be able to practice regulating it and again, give yourself an outlet, um, to, to express those emotions that you may not want to do in front of your team. You're going to have to explain to my wife tonight why I'm out talking to the seagulls when my children start driving me crazy. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love it. <laughs> okay, very good. So next question came in that's, that's uh, pretty interesting is um, any advice for recovering from a leadership mistake? Uh, yes, because you're, you're going to make them. None of us is perfect. We all make leadership mistakes. I think actually the best policy is to be forthright and say, I made a mistake. That vulnerability with your people will show them that you're authentic, that you are, you know, uh, understand you're fallible just as they are fallible. Uh, own up to it, say why you made it and what you're doing to correct it. Okay. It isn't just sort of, okay, I screwed up here. I made a mistake. Here's how I made the mistake. Here's, you know, maybe the, you share some reasoning with them. And then here's what I'm doing to fix it. Uh, that shows you're learning. It shows you're getting better. But that um, is really, really uh, that vulnerability is, is really will buy you a lot of credibility with your followers. So it's super important. Yeah, without a doubt. 
All right. So on to the uh, the communication section. Um, this came in from Chad and uh, someone else had asked it earlier too, but uh, the shortened version of it is how do you break down silos organizationally in order to foster communication uh, and at more of a we mentality for the greater good? And Chad specifically was asking, um, so you mentioned avoiding working in silos from a safety perspective, but what if the entire organization operates in silos? Legacy companies and divisions and departments conduct different training at different times using different learning management systems and platforms. How do you attempt to break down all those different silos across those different categories? Uh, and if it's taking too long to break them down, uh, or you just simply can't, how would you move forward with driving a positive safety culture and making change in such a complicated situation? Um, so, Peter, I, I have a feeling you have some thoughts on this one as well. But uh, <laughs> my, 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 br my brief take is, and what I have found is, don't talk about breaking down the silos. Talk about connecting them intelligently. Mm -hmm. Those individual functions exist for a reason. There's specialized knowledge, there's specialized processes, in some cases, equipment and training and reasons people do that. So you're, it's much less threatening to say, we want to connect these silos intelligently, not we want to break them down. Think for a minute about your body. Your body is full of dozens of specialized structures. And we don't ask the heart to do the job of the liver or the liver to do the job of the skin. But they're all functioning very distinctly, but in harmony. That's the same thing we're looking for in organizations, right? People that they, there are certain people, you don't want your accountants doing HR, you don't want your HR folks doing your, uh, you know, <clears throat> doing the finance stuff. You want them doing those functions, but you want to make sure they're working harmoniously. So talking in those terms is much less threatening than saying we got to break down the silos. And safety is one of those ways you can create that harmony because it gives some common ground. Yeah, that's great. I think the only thing I would add to that is uh, more of a what not to do um, uh, aspect, which is never call anyone's baby ugly. So <laughs> if you see they've developed something and they've been using it and you come in and essentially say, hey, I've got something better, different for you, that's literally calling their baby ugly and they will just shut down and they don't want to listen to you. Um, so think of it from that perspective. I think that can be really, really helpful as you try to figure out what to do in your specific scenario. All right. Um, another one actually just came in. I, I'd love to jump to this because I think it's pretty interesting for folks that are getting started uh, in this industry. Um, how do you start a new job in the safety industry with just no confidence without feeling overwhelmed and anxious about failure? Always a challenge. Uh, first off, realize they gave you a job for a reason. <clears throat> so they, they someone has some confidence in you. You may not think you can fully inhabit the role yet, but they saw something in you that is important. It, you're good enough. We're going to give you a job. We're going to pay you a salary. You get to walk in the door and be here as part of us. So don't underestimate that. Realize that you, if you are early in your career or early in a position, you're going to be doing a lot of learning. And the first thing I would focus on is relationships. <clears throat> don't worry about getting stuff done right away, but get the relationships in place and begin to learn how does the place tick? What's the, the, the vibe here? Uh, who are the important players? Begin to build those relationships. And as you do that, your, your social confidence will grow. And then your special your your expertise as a, as a safety professional, <clears throat> that will blossom as well. Don't go in thinking you have to impress everybody with your 17 things you know how to do um, right away. Build those relationships first, and then you'll find out how to express things, how to ask. Just asking questions sometimes will begin to, to open up some interesting conversations, and your confidence will naturally grow as you feel more comfortable there. Yeah, and I would just add, don't sell yourself short. Um, sometimes you think, um, I forgot, is it the Dunning-Kruger effect where you, you learn a bunch of stuff and then you realize how much you don't really know? Well, everybody yeah. else that doesn't have your job hasn't learned those <clears throat> things. So you actually do know a lot more than most people. And all you have to do to be an expert is know 1% more than everybody else. <laughs> Always remember that and you can continue to get better and better over time. That's right. All right. Uh, so kind of going along that theme of, of just like buy-in and, and making sure you don't have imposter syndrome. Um, how do you get buy-in from employees who just don't see value in your, uh, your objectives? Uh, and then that leads on to like management as well. Like there's a lot of people you need to get buy-in from. I know we talked about it a bit be before, but can you maybe extrapolate on that a little bit? Sure. So you have to, first of all, think the, the language they're thinking and or what they care about. So there are people who are going to care about the financial side of the impact of, of, of safety. And you've got to be able to talk that language and say, okay, we understand for each each day loss costs us this, and you can actually roll out some data and some numbers to back that up. 
other people you want to have a very human conversation if you're with someone and you see a picture of their young kids on the on their desk um have that conversation and how important their family is to them and so if their family is important to them they want to get home in, as good as they came to work in the morning so that that safety issue is very much about making sure you get back to that family and you're that great parent or that great sibling um and you're connecting with them on that level i think that the the the, the, the trap i see people, people walk into is that they come in with the things that, that the safety folks care about and we think okay i'm going to make you care about the things i care about yeah. No, I got to find out the things you care about and then wrap my what, what I need to get done, wrap that into it somehow. It take, takes some finesse and it takes a little bit more work. But when you can connect with what they care about um, and show how what you're doing is relevant to it. Now, all of a sudden, they become much more open to having that conversation and, and taking the appropriate actions. And when you think about safety culture, you talked about this, it's super important to make it just part of what you do. What are some of the ways to connect with people to make safety just a core value for everyone and really instill a safety mindset, especially in young people who think they're invincible, especially when they do dangerous jobs? Uh, or as one person actually asked, I'm looking here, shift the focus from one of compliance to one of ownership. That's right. And I think that, and again, I think that is a, the ownership piece is really important. And thank you to the person who asked that question. Uh, I think when you actually can give them a role in this so that um, if they see something they can do that should be done differently or better, or where they can raise the safety flag and say, hold on, we're not doing this the right way. You empower them to be part of the, the solution. They're much more likely to be, to, to jump on board with this. Um, in some cases you do have to bring the compliance stick and say, no, we do it this way, but explain why. We do it this way because we've seen, you know, we've seen this accident, or we know our, our peer organizations have seen this kind of incident, and we don't want it to happen to you. Uh, you have to be good at storytelling in this job uh, and relate to this. But um, but also, as I like giving people, you know, it's, it's amazing. Again, one I work with a number of firms in the energy sector, and one of them very much that you know gave in the energy sector. You often work in a situation where you're one of multiple companies on a given site. And their employees are told, if you if, if this site is not meeting our standards, which have been you know at a high level has been negotiated before they do the work, but if they're not meeting our standards, you have our permission to stop and just not do what you're, not, you know you stop you pull back and we're done. That really shows them the organization takes it seriously and that they have a role and it helps them avoid that peer pressure of oh we're going to cut the corners here or we're not going to quite do it that way. No, I know my management is going to back me up if I say we're not doing it because we're stopping because they were going to take this shortcut or they were not going to do things a certain way. Um, that really helps. And uh, but again, I think finding stories both in the organization, in the industry uh, to talk about what the good things when, they, when things go right, but also the bad things that can happen when things go wrong uh, and realize that there are consequences. Uh, and that's. Well, you know, it's, it, you do it. And storytelling makes it much less threatening than walking in and saying, "Okay, you didn't do steps one through four correctly. We're going to yell at you." Yeah, and you mentioned storytelling, which it seems like there's two uh, things that you have in your vault that you can use, which is storytelling or anecdotes, and then you've got statistics. When is it better to use one or the other? To me, it seems like you know. I always uh, the phrase I say is, "You can tug at the heartstrings with stories and anecdotes, but you really tug at the purse strings." with statistics, but it seems like the statistics resonate with the executives, whereas the stories resonate more with the people that are doing the jobs. Anything you would comment on that? I would in that way. I mean, one of the things we know about communication is that people don't listen to your data until you've made an emotional connection with it, with you and they trust you so that the, um, the that's, what, that's what the story can do. The story can animate it. You know, I used to be an editor at, at Harvard Business Review way back in the day. And the formula for a perfect story there was always, aha, here's mm. something I didn't know before. So what? Why do I care? Now what? What do I do about it? So in that order. So those first couple of steps give you that, that hook. The story can be good there. Hey, I didn't know this. Why do I care? Why does it matter? And then you can get into all the data that backs it up. If you just throw data at people, often it will go, it'll go over their heads. Unless you get to, a, you know, you're talking to a true data nerd. That's all they care about. But most folks want that connection. 
All right, guys, thank you so much. That is all the time that we have for questions, but I do have some additional resources for all of our attendees. But first, I wanna go ahead and just launch our final poll before we wrap up. So, um, you know, you've heard from Peter, who's our communication expert at Alert Media, but we also have a full team of experienced experts in safety, security, business continuity, crisis management. So just take a moment, if you could, right now to let us know if you'd like to hear more about how Alert Media can help. You can say yes, and we will get you some more information, or you can say no, not at this time, and no hard feelings. So we'll just give that one more moment. And then let's go ahead and close that out because I want to get to these additional resources. So first, we have um, Eric's book that I alluded to earlier, and um, I spy it over his shoulder in his camera frame, <laughs> which is You're It, Crisis, Change, and How to Lead When It Matters Most. You can find that book anywhere you can buy books. I also encourage you to go to the NPLI website. So Google NPLI at Harvard University, they have just a lot of great information um, and amazing leadership programs that you can check out. And then finally, we have Alert Media's Emergency Response Plan template. That is downloadable for free at alertmedia.com and it can really help you build a comprehensive emergency plan. So with all of that, I would just like to thank Eric and Peter for being with us today. Eric, I'll start with you. Thank you so much. You're just a wealth of information and I appreciate you sharing it with us. A pleasure. Thank you. And thank you to the, for all the people in the audience for, for the work you do. Yeah. Wonderful. And we do have an attendee that said they just ordered your book. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and Peter, thank you. I, it's always great to host these with you. I love learning um, all about communication from you. No, it's been great. Thank you, everyone, for attending. We really appreciate it. Hopefully that was useful content for you. And Eric, you are awesome as always. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, that concludes our presentation. Thank you for spending part of your day with us. Please come back for another Alert Media webinar. We love to see familiar names and faces on our screens. And of course, I want to thank Safety and Health Magazine for hosting us. They are always such an amazing partner.